are back on the Zero Hour. I, as always, am your host, Richard R.J. Escal, and I always look forward to speaking with my next guest. He helps me put things in context in the perspective of history, understanding the moment not as a kind of free-form chaos of uh, random information, but as uh, a point in the curve of history. So Harvey J.K. is Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, and he's author of a number of books, including Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, The Fight for the Four Freedoms, subtitled What Makes F- What Made FDR and the Greatest Generation Truly Great, and FDR on Democracy, The Greatest Speeches and Writings of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His Twitter handle is Harvey J K K A Y E, and he joins us now. So first of all, Harvey, welcome back to the program. It is a tremendous pleasure. You know, as I said to you, my own life right now is okay, but all day I agonize. And when I'm able to talk to you, the agony not only gets in part vented, but it's just a relief to know you're there, Richard. That's all. Well, thank you, Harvey. I feel exactly the same way about you. And I have not been feeling that great either about the world in general. And uh, so let's kind of do a little mutual therapy here. Uh, You wrote a piece back after Donald Trump was elected a president, also not a great moment. Uh, And there's something uh, you wrote uh, that I wanted to quote, uh, because, you know, I look at, uh, you know, I look upon these Democrats and despair. Uh, So you wrote, and I'm quoting you now, Democrats must learn to speak of America's historic promise, its historic struggles and achievements, and its historic possibility, historical possibilities. If the members of a newly reconstituted Democratic National Committee do not know about America's radical, progressive, and social democratic traditions, and I bet that many of them do not, uh, I will not take that bet, Harvey, they must study up fast. Uh, and if they don't appreciate that progressive change requires more than spark policies and programs, they must be educated to do so. How, if at all, would you amend that statement in the light of the past five years or so? I would I would not amend that statement at all, except the urgency is is I mean, it's you can I can feel the urgency all the more. So in the wake of the election of November 2016, we were devastated and even before that election, I kept imagining that candidates on the liberal to progressive spectrum and beyond would make the most of American history. I had imagined that they would have finally learned that if a guy like Trump poaches Ronald Reagan's line, make America great again, that they would have they would learn to ch- not simply to try to debunk what he's saying, because that just feeds into it, okay? But that they would have learned how to transcend it. Mm. And they didn't. And over and over again, we have seen the repetition of what I can only say is 45 years of democratic retreats and failings, with certain moments along the way admittedly showing promise. I mean, I'm not going to knock Biden for the American Rescue Plan. I'm not going to. I'm not going to knock the effort of at least uh, uh, the the squad and Bernie to try to make sure a, a, an ill an ill named Build Back Better program of originally six trillion reduced to three trillion reduced to one point seven five trillion. That that there were those moments, but it remains the case. Here we are. I mean, six years later, and. The Democrats do not know how to transcend the hijacking of history and what it's brought us. And this goes back to, as I said, to Ronald Reagan, that hijacking. And over and over again, it's as they run from the past. They're not just running from the Republicans. They're running from the American story. Hmm. What do you mean by that? That's an interesting comment. Okay. So, look, I've made this argument over and over again, and I'm willing to happily to make it again. The American story is undeniably marked by terrible, tragic 
experiences of exploitation and oppression and injustices, racial, class, and gender. We know all of that. But when we respond to the hijacking of history and the arguments of the likes of Reagan about the divine ordination of America, the trick is not to debunk that. The trick is to reveal to people, remind people that that which is good in America, and I'll just quickly point out, I mean, for a start, we did, we did struggle and secure the right to vote for at least white working men by the 1830s. We did secure from the First Amendment the separation of church and state, which, by the way, was fought for both by free thinkers and evangelicals who did not wish to be dominated by state churches or powerful religious cabals. We saw the struggles of women to secure their rights which they eventually is sort of marked in 1920 and then later in the 1960s. And we've seen struggles that actually have secured, if you like, a greater reality, have made more real that promise in the Declaration of Equality and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It, it, we don't have slavery any longer. We don't have the, we don't deny, However much the Republicans are trying to do that, we, we, in law, we do not deny folks the right to vote. We do not deny workers the right to organize. The struggle now is all about those kinds of things, undeniably. But it is the case that those experiences that we, and struggles, that's what liberals, progressives, radicals, socialists should be embracing and reminding people of, making people feel just guilty or making people feel just soured is not going to get us anywhere. People have to know that struggle matters, okay? And I would just point out as a sidebar, and I'll stop and, and hand you back to the mic. Martin Luther King Jr. in the late 60s, in the, in the most, tri he actually hit a very, very dark moment in the late 60s. And right. he then, and I'm not inventing, this is not something I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create. I read this uh, from, uh, by someone who knew him well, at, it was in those moments that Martin Luther King Jr. grabbed hold of the statement by Thomas Paine. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. And he made that his fallback. In other words, when he felt terribly depressed about things, whether it had to do with, you know, opposition to equal rights, whether it had to do by the fact, undeniably, that the, 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 the black movement, was, the civil rights movement, not black, but the civil rights movement was splitting you might say, into black power and civil rights. At those moments, he reached for Thomas Paine's, we have it in our power to begin the world over again, which is both utterly true and to a certain extent, of course, utterly false. But the truth is what is so compelling. And the fact is, we've got to remember, we have done it many a time. We have expanded the we and we the people, and we have made Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All I'm not, you know, again, I want to make it clear. When I sit, talk like this, folks on, to my left and even to my, even not so far to my left will say, oh, but what about? And I'm saying you cannot discuss the struggles without having acknowledged and realized just how awful the oppression and exploitation was. But the struggles of those generations were intended to transcend that. And if we simply wallow, in the, in, the, in the darkness, you might say, of those generations, then we're going to literally be unfair. We're going to literally marginalize those experiences and marginalize the very folks who were supposedly seeking to redeem in our memories and today create a, a more equal, just, free, democratic America. Sorry. I, no, I'm, no, no, that's okay. Yeah. And there's so much I want to uh, uh, reflect on in what you just said, but I'll start with this, which is you raise, just raised almost in passing a really interesting point, which is when we think about it, we think about justice and injustice in a lateral way in terms of this moment, this historical moment. Yeah. But there's also the notion of injustice distributed over time, which you just mentioned, and the idea that uh, we talk, for example, about honoring the experiences of those around us, the experiences of people who are members of various uh, minority groups who have disabilities, who have other experiences we need to elevate and, and uh, respect and uh, give attention to. But, uh, you know, I hear you saying, and I, I appreciate very much, that if we 
surrender to despair because things are, are in fact extremely daunting right now then in effect we are failing to honor the people who overcame quite daunting challenges i would venture to say equally daunting challenges yes. perhaps more so in history you know i mean this is one reason why uh, i continue i even mentioned to another guest uh, this week that i read about you know various periods you know i listed them earlier today in Amer in american and other world history where people overcame mm, terrible burdens i mean if if if, if labor rights, for example, seem hard to attain now, or how much harder they must have seemed in the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, so, <laughs> right. so and on and on we could go. But uh, so I think that's a wonderful point. You know, it's a challenge in time as well and as in space. Um, but uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and I also, uh, in that context, I also want to talk about uh, you know uh, i mean that's a bracing kind of thing right that's a that's a source of courage of inspiration but i do also want to say that one of the things i struggle with is i think and one of the reasons why i find that bracing and helpful so thank you for that harvey is is because i think too many people on the broader left you know, broadly defined, yes. look to rely on politicians and party for strength and inspiration. And I, I'm not sure that's a very good thing to do. And yeah, right. he said delicately. And uh, <laughs> for example, um, perhaps you saw the New York Times Siena College poll that was published in the New York Times this week, uh, showing that in the Democratic Party is increasingly deriving support from college graduates who are, yes. you know, a form of elite. They're not, uh, you know, I think any adjunct professor would tell you that that uh, in definition of elite has to be stretched to a certain extent, uh, yeah. but, but they are a kind of elite. And that, uh, in fact, new polling shows that the blue collar working class is increasingly not a demographic that turns to the Democratic Party, unlike in the days of Roosevelt, right. and that in fact we're seeing uh, whether it's the party turning away from the working class or the working turn class turning away from the party, I would argue both, uh, that there's a drift taking place here. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with all of this, but I well, think if I could help, but if you're not yeah. sure, let me just give you a, a turn okay. in that, okay? Sure. So look, I mean, again, let's think historically. And the fact is that this this turning this turning away from the Democratic Party, which you know, that's how people talk about it as if this was something that took place over time and slowly but surely. And that's the case. But if we go back into the 70s, if we go back to the 70s, it really begins at that moment where where the Democrats under Carter. OK. And the ensuing candidates and, and presidents did turn away. OK, I mean, we saw in the late 70s a determination by Jimmy Carter to to launch what we've come to know of as neoliberalism. Now, in 1980, when Ronald Reagan won, my recollection and I've I've read about it, but I haven't read about it in, in, in recent months. My recollection is that. Millions of people just stayed home. And those would have been, in most cases, I'm willing to bet, working people stayed home instead of turning out to vote. So basically, Reagan won with a, a, probably a fairly limited percentage of the eligible vote over Carter. People just were so fed up with Carter. I mean, he had already brought in Volcker, who was driving up the unemployment ranks. So what happens is the demo, you know, working people are sort of are alienated by this kind of thing. Not to mention, you think about that in California, you'll recall there were those uh, ballot initiatives to reduce taxes, property taxes, whatever else. And, you know, what, what people don't realize is that in the 70s, and I referred to Carter, in the 70s, capital, putting it bluntly, capital declared war on the democratic achievements of the New Deal and the Great Society years. And, that, and they targeted labor. They targeted right. labor. Okay. I, there's a, I remember this line 
which sounds, I don't know if it was true or not, but this line was the fastest growing enterprise in America in the 1970s was union busting law firms. That, that you know, that I'll never forget when I was told that by, by unionists who I knew. So, okay, so they turn us. So what, if you can't vote for a wage and your union is incapable, in fact, it's probably getting broken up, you're going to vote for the guy who says he'll lower your taxes. It's a simple equation, okay? If, if your wallet is, is emptying, Okay, and you've got kids coming up who have to go to college or want to get married or whatever the case might be, you're going to do what you can to secure it. So here's the Republicans saying, well, we're going to reduce government, government sort of activity, you know, limit government. That's a limited government. We're going to reduce taxes. I mean, it sounds great because at that point, at that point, it's your taxes are going to look all the more oppressive to you if your wages aren't keeping up. And let's not forget, that was a time of stagflation. So workers were suffering, suffering the inflation of the day and also the threat that they would join the ranks of the unemployed. Now, this, this, so we have all these years unfolding. Now, here's the thing. Republicans found really, really successful means, if you like, to peel working people away from the Democratic Party so long as the Democratic Party had turned its back on the very democratic achievements that made the Democrats the majority party from 1932 all the way through into the early 1970s. I mean, it's, it's it, what, look, I know most people, hell, some of the people listening to this aren't even old enough to have been alive <laughs> in the 1970s, but you and I are old enough to know this has been going on year after year over and over again. And where have we ever seen Democratically, Democratic Party leaders, right, do something. Now, I, again, you, as you just said, it, good politics involves far more than politicians. But it's also the case that the labor movement, having been smashed, a lot of labor union, union leaders decided my job is to protect my union, okay, without realizing it's as if they became amnesiacs as well as to what it took to create the labor movement. Let's, and the labor movement story goes way back in, in American history. But the real labor movement story of one of every three workers in a union, that begins in the 1930s. And the labor, and you know, the New Deal wasn't just a matter of FDR and the Democrats passing legislation. It, it involved labor unionists demanding certain kinds of rights. And in fact, FDR told them, even after laws were passed, there's a, there's a quote from FDR, New laws in themselves do not bring the millennium. In other words, the, the struggle goes on. And that's the president of the United States who himself was being educated more and more by working people and labor union leaders like John Lewis and Sidney Hillman to the imperative of not simply seeking to pass laws and sign them into law or pass bills and sign them into law, but also basically to mobilize working people, mobilize them. And by the way, we haven't seen Democrats. I don't even think there's been a Democrat in. I can't even remember any Democrat remembering any of that kind of history or, or speaking about it. In fact, other than, other than Bernie, really, and, and I don't think he did enough on, in, the, in those terms to speak of those struggles. He seems to be doing it more now than he ever did when he was running for president. The fact is that we, other than Bernie, I don't think anyone's even really mentions FDR any longer, okay? And, uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not making FDR out to be the saint. It's, the ex it's that FDR learned as a political figure because working people taught him that if you're going to make things happen, and I'll use Bernie's hashtag, not me, us. Right, which is a, a great hashtag. The and, best, absolutely. And, uh, you know, without relitigating the whole you know, Hillary Clinton issue, yeah. I, I will say that the hashtag I'm with her versus not me us <laughs> yeah. was in a sense individuality versus collectivism, you know. That's right. Yes. Uh, and, and that was, I think, really people resonated with that. But Harvey K., let me uh, sort of lay out a very simplistic formula of the oversimplified overly simplistic, but just uh, kind of see if you could see a potential analogy there. It could be argued that the moment, referring to first FDR, 
the moment, meaning, you know, the depression and all the political activity that swirled around that, the Townsend clubs, as they were called, calling for something yeah. like social security, the labor movement, the communists, the various different things going on, the fervor of the time, ferment of the time, the, the moment made a movement that made a president. Uh, and obviously, I'm oversimplifying. The president had 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 um, agency, of course, and the movement had agency, it's, it's so on. But you know, in a sense, there was a moment, made a movement, made a president, and that we're getting to the point of a movement that a moment rather that is starting to make. We had we had Occupy 10, 11 years ago. We we had uh, Black yes. Lives Matter a couple of years ago. That we we may start be starting to see a moment making a movement that might potentially make a president. I think there was a moment when some people thought that it, that it might even be uh, a Joe Biden. Uh, I'm not sure I was one of those people, but uh, but uh, he seemed uh, for a second to be, I, I didn't think he was going to rise to an FDR level, but he seemed to be thinking he might try to do something. He feels now to me like he's completely fallen back. But but uh, you get what I'm driving at, and do you think that's a potentiality in the yes, next? Yes, I do. But I do want, to, and I. By the way, and I'm glad you brought up the movements of you know a d decade and a half a dozen years ago. I mean, yes, Black Lives Matter, Moral Monday movement. I want to remind right. everyone that you know everyone remembers Occupy, but I want to remind people that. Here in Wisconsin, we had a Wisconsin rising. We had 100,000 Right, people. I'm sorry to omit that, yeah. No, no, I mean, I mean, in many ways, it looked like that was the last gasp of the FDR experience. Right. But in fact, it, you know, when people sang, this is what democracy looks like, at least the song reverberated. And we saw all across the country, the fight for 15, the anti-fracking movement. I mean, it was all percolating. And, and by the way, I mean, if Hillary had not, you know, look, people get upset when I say this, but if there had not been a Clinton machine that really sort of strangled uh, the Democratic Party, unless it, unless Hillary was the president uh, or, or at least nominee, the fact is that those movements would have found perhaps their FDR in Bernie Sanders and they would have educated him all the more to what what he needed to do in 2016 when you were working with, if I can reveal that, when you were working with Bernie. Right. So. Here we are these many years later, and we've already had, I mean, look, history doesn't exactly repeat itself, but you can feel it percolating. So, for example, I mean, to my mind, it was a shame that there wasn't a change in the leadership of the AFL-CIO. Having said that, it's the case that the younger generation, the and, and, you know, if you like the... the the cover story is always going to be Chris Smalls, but it's going on not only right. in New York and, and the warehouse. This is going on all across the country. The media still has yet, they're running fearful of it. They still have yet to make real sense of it. And there are leaders out there. Look, I mean, I have a, a particular attachment to the, to the aspirations of Sarah Nelson, whose dream is yeah. to save democracy by re-energizing the labor movement. And I will join her in, in, in those efforts. And, and I've made that known to her. The fact is that, yeah, this stuff is happening. So I'm not, I'm, I'm despairing about November because my bigger, my fear beyond that is that they'll take the House and the Senate. And whether, whether a Democrat wins in 2024, the popular vote or not, they're going to make sure that the re Republicans win. You know, I mean, who knows what the Supreme Court will decide on that North Car is a North Carolina case that, that we know of. But, but having said that, it's also the case, and Sarah has said that, and, and Sarah Nelson has said this, it's got to be the case that, that the new dynamic, the new struggle to save democracy probably is in the organizing of workers, in all their diversity. And we have that advantage today. The labor movement is more diverse than it has ever, ever mm -hmm. been. And it was, by the way, far more diverse in the 30s than most Americans realize. It wasn't strictly a white man's uh, movement. It was a very diverse movement. But nowadays, it's well beyond that, um, that, that state of diversity. So, I mean, the possibilities are tremendous. Let's put it this way. So close, and yet so far is this feeling I right. keep having, right? <laughs> Right. And and I'm really glad you brought up the diversity. And of course, you know, going way back to the beginning of the United Mine Workers and the, Oh yeah. Right. Everybody, I mean the union 
the movement, you know, I know for a while in the 60s when hard hats were beating up hippies, there was a sense that, you know, union workers were reactionary or whatever, but the union movement throughout the vast majority of its history has been a great progressive force. And I love the fact that, you know, t- to me, history and culture are as well as politics and economics, they're all tied together. And the fact that it seems like culturally now among young people, uh, union activity is embraced. You know, it's not people yeah. aren't distancing themselves from it. It's it's part of the zeitgeist in a way that it hadn't been for a long time. I, I, I'm Look, thrilled about that. I, fact, think- I, gotta, I, mean, I, I get a kick out of the fact that I can't avoid, I mean, out here in the Midwest, you can't avoid walking into a Starbucks, but I've got a star. I've got my Starbucks union late thing, uh, you know, and you can tell which workers behind the counter are just thrilled to see somebody walk in with it. I fly Delta Airlines because that's literally the, you know, you're going to leave Green Bay by air. You got to fly Delta and the airline flight attendants have a major organizing program there. And I make it a point of wearing my AFA pin that Sarah Nelson gave me and i and you can tell who on the plane which one of the uh, the, the flight attendants oh, that's great yeah you know and, and the trick is that we should all be wearing those kinds of pins and to right. show that even those of us who are older or indeed not specifically in what would be considered traditional working class occupation that we're in solidarity with these folks and we want to see these things happen now, I had to buy a charger for my laptop because I left it at home when I went to Philadelphia last week. And uh, so I went to the Apple store and I told the guy, you guys ought to unionize like the <laughs> store back in Maryland where I where I bought this laptop. So uh-huh. uh, it, it's a great feeling. You know, I mean, it really is a great yeah, feeling. Right. The, um, uh, but, uh, you know, the other piece of it, all of this, whether it's sure. talking about labor rights or the other things, that, uh, women's march, I left that out of my list, too. Incredible. Right. You know, millions of people, 10 million people around the world, you know, responding to this thing spontaneous that formed spontaneously. But the thing that we have hanging over us is, the, you know, a totalitarian judiciary that is you know, not uh, the Supreme Court, but not just the Supreme Court. And the reaction to that, I mean, from a historian's point of view, the fact that, you know, a friend of ours, Ryan Cooper, has written for the New Republic or someplace saying, you know, uh, judicial review should be thrown out and right, you know, right. <laughs> all sorts of things are being proposed. You know, people are now of all things um, uh, favorably quoting Andrew Jackson, you know, the racist president, you know, quoting Andrew Jackson saying, you know, Justice Marshall has made him this, his decision. Now let him rape, muster his army to enforce it or whatever the exact quote was. So, um, yeah. He, the, these are crazy times, but I have to admit that the totalitarian judiciary is something that, um, first of all, I hate the word judiciary because it forces me to display the sibilant S that is uh, my little speech defect. But, but, um, anyway, uh, it is something that worries me a lot. And from a historian's point of view, I don't know what your take on that is. Well, I, yeah, I, I... Uh, yes, I, I am. I am fearful. I am fearful, undeniably. And I think, you know, what? another piece I wrote, which I'm sure we talked about at some point, was right after, um, was not long after the piece that we're talking about right now. And I said, uh, creeping, I said, it can happen here. You know, the Sinclair Lewis novel, it can't happen here. Was that yeah? That was Sinclair Lewis, and 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 he actually wanted to title the novel "It Can Happen Here" back in 1935. The novel, and the fact is that it was happening here. It, I mean, it wasn't Trump. It was all right. Trump and these right wing fascist types are literally they're just drawn out of the woodwork by the failure of the the party that should have countered this for 45 years. I mean, look the rights of workers, women, and people of color, voters actually in all their diversity, have been under siege for 45 to 50 years. And it just got over and over again, our failure to stand up to this over. I mean, God, I mean, look, I'm 72, 45 years. I've actually 
it's amazing to me that when I was growing up, you know, probably up until the age of 30, I had the assumption that this was going to be an ever more progressive, ever more social democratic United States. I mean, I grew up in a Roosevelt kind of household. I came through the 60s. I know the 60s had their ugliest of moments, but you could never have convinced me in 1970 that by 1980, we were not going to have national health care, that the right. right of a woman to choose was going to be that we were going to fail to legislate that. I mean, all these things. And now 45 years of this over and over again. And so in essence, people who were so shocked by Trump, I just thought, oh my God, this is like, this is it. This is like the, not the cherry on top, but the poison on top, the, the final you know, dash of poison on, on this process been going on. So yeah, I, I, I am fearful. And probably, and I, I don't think we're ready to pursue it because we've been talking about labor's, you know, development, redevelopment. But in the face of of that possibility of of a, an American style fascism, the idea of a general strike is not should not. We should keep this in our heads, but it requires tremendous organization to make it happen. Really does. Um, you know, I was with a really good friend last week who who. Uh, served in the Johnson administration and when in the midst of all the hopes of, you know, civil rights, voting rights and all that. And he said to me, what do you think American fascism will look like? And could you define it? And I said, I said, I, I don't know if I can define it. I know it's not going to look exactly like European, central European fascism. It's just not. Okay. But we've got examples in Hungary and elsewhere of what that might involve, the sort of plebiscitarian you know, well, but, you know, they'll have so controlled the elections that it'll seem like we're still in some fashion, this democratic America, but where we won't be. And by the way, I, I think, look, the majority of Americans want a progressive America. I mean, we're talking about the takeover of the Supreme Court and our electoral process by a minority. Of course we are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, see, to me, I guess you know, when people ask me about american fascism to me it's it's a gradient right it's a it's yeah. a spectrum and we've been on it for a long time yeah and so, right so the question you know sometimes it's further over to the right sometimes it's not as far over but to me you know everybody's elevating uh liz cheney now i did a monologue already today about the democratic the big democratic donors giving money to liz cheney to me while she's doing a good job on the committee to me the the cheney trump divide it, it, it's an internal debate within the totalitarian movement as far as yeah, I'm concerned. that's right and yes so you know and to me some democrats when they want to censor speech and so on you know it's a, a more moderate totalitarianism but you know what is Sheldon Wolin, you know, the political scientist inverted. Yes. Totality. Oh, yeah. you, you know, we could talk about this all day, but just remind, I must go back and reread the Sheldon Wolin as I think about it. Yes, it's more timely than ever. Right. You know, he is missed as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, it just uh, in that in that vein, I mean, I have to say that what we've seen these last few years, the, the, the fear on the part of the corporate Democrats, their capacity to mobilize millions upon millions of dollars to crush progressive democratic candidates okay i mean this is a party that in itself has behaved in right if you like authoritarian ways and 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 mobilized arguments that just might well be mobilized by by sorry not by fascists but at least right wingers yeah. i mean the, you know i mean i can i would name the candidates but the list is growing too long to remember them all yeah, I know. I know. Including right here in Maryland in the district next to mine. So, yeah, I, you know, if the Democratic Party were Democratic, they would ban, you know, dark money and pack money and primaries and things like that. So, look, you know, we've got our work cut out for us. But I guess, yes. you know, if you have well, any closing yeah. thoughts, including. I do. Hell, I actually do. I actually. do. OK, give us a closing thought okay. so that we you don't brought just up Liz stay Cheney and, and the, the January in, the hearings. It's okay. interesting to me. I mean. Look, probably the words that will be remembered will be words spoken by someone like Jamie Raskin from those hearings. OK. Mm -hmm. And I think what's interesting is in that in those in those hearings, we occasionally hear references to history. So we know that these progressives, when 
when they're up against the wall, because by the way, they may be running the hearings, but we're, but in terms of politics and the, and the threat to, to American democracy, we're up against the wall. Here are these moments where they're talking historically. Well, damn it, why aren't they out there talking to their fellow Americans, not simply about, you know, the, about, you know, elections, but literally about the struggles that went into the making of the rights as they advanced from the time of the revolution all the way through the 19th, all the way through the 20th century. In other words, they, they're capable of doing it. I, I don't know, but they're, it's as if they're afraid to go public with this other than at a moment which has this solemnity to it, a, a congressional hearing. Very disappointing. I, I, I hope Jamie Raskin hears this. Well, he's a smart guy. So, yes, he is. Know, and, yeah, and, I mean, Jamie this- Raskin is the guy who presented a resolution, which I, and, which I endorsed, for, to build a monument to Thomas Paine in the District of Columbia these, you know, this year to do it. He just introduced it recently. Well, damn it, Jamie Raskin ought to literally get the Progressive Caucus to open their mouths about the American story. Well, that would be lovely, but, uh, you know, and he's a scholar himself, as you know, constitutional law. Yeah, but, uh, right. All right. Well, we'll have to leave it there. And I'm sure we'll talk more than once between now and the election and we'll figure out how to motivate ourselves. But uh, I'll talk. I'll vote in the primaries next week. So good. uh, Anyway, Harvey J.K., historian, uh, great observer of of current events and so much more. As always, thank you for coming on the program. It's a great pleasure and great insight to talk to you. So thank Thank you for listening to my thoughts and rants. Oh, it's a pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.